Good morning to all of you. The subject that we are going to deliberate on today is can India be self-reliant in defense? At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to have a very privileged and eminent selection of personalities to present their views before all of you. I am deeply honored to be on this panel with them. That is Admiral Arun Prakash, Air Marshal Philip Rajkumar, and Shri Sanjay Prasad. While I leave the topical question to the end, I have no hesitation in stating at the outset that no nation can meet its comprehensive defense and security needs without high levels of self-reliance. As a prelude to the speakers, I wish to highlight only four issues. The first, even a brief look at the map of our country with its neighborhood brings to home the fact that given our two largest aggressive and unpredictable neighbors with large swathes of contested borders and seas, our existential security and larger strategic autonomy demand high levels of self-reliance in defense. Second, in an international power equation or in the equations that prevail in the world, strategic, strategic reach, diplomatic leverage, autonomy of action is only possible if you wield comprehensive national power. And comprehensive national power is not possible without high levels of self-reliance. Third, history informs us that ever since the dawn of the industrial wars, commencing with the American Civil War in 1860, going on to the world wars, no nation had the best possible and the most desirable weapons, equipment, and ammunition. They all made compromises. They all took long-term decisions. The fourth point is, when you, ladies and gentlemen, think of the spectrum of war and conflict today, it is useful to remember that it is spread over the spatial domains of land, sea, undersea, air, space, and the unrestricted domains of the electronic spectrum and perception management. Add to this the relatively new galloping horsemen of apocalypse artificial intelligence. Highly developed nations today are challenged to manage these. Our situation is far more critical. With these few comments, ladies and gentlemen, I would not like to hand you over to our uh, panel of very, very eminent speakers. And I would like to introduce the first speaker who will uh, give his views, Admiral Arun Prakash, who was the 20th Naval Chief and concurrent chairman of the Chiefs of Staff Committee. A naval aviator by specialization, he commanded a fighter squadron and several warships, significantly the aircraft carrier Virat. He has had the privilege of heading the Indian Navy's aviation and personnel branches, as well as three significant commands of the Eastern Naval Fleet, Andaman Nicobar Joint Command, Western Naval Command. A war veteran, of the 1971 war, he was decorated for gallantry with the Veer Chakra in this war when serving with the Indian Air Force. <clears throat> Post-retirement, he has served on the National Security Advisory Board and headed the National Maritime Foundation. He currently holds a distinguished chair in India's Naval War College. I would like to add as a soldier and a junior officer when he was the naval chief, 
He was directly instrumental in giving the services and getting the services, the enhanced package of the Sixth Pay Commission. And that is attributed squarely to you, sir. And we thank you for that. He will today speak on the challenges to defense modernization. Admiral, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Within the rubric of self-reliance and defense, the topic of defense modernization assumes great significance uh, given the serious national security crisis that our country faces today. Uh, at the outset, let me clarify what exactly is meant by defense modernization. Now, every piece of military equipment, whether it's a gun, tank, ship, or aircraft, has a finite life of 15, 20, or 30 years after which it becomes obsolete and needs to be replaced. But since all hardware cannot be replaced at the same time, the process is spread over many years, and that is how the military keeps itself in a continuous state of modernization. At any given time, only about a third of any military's equipment should be old and obsolete. About half should be of current vintage, and 20 to 30 percent should be modern or state of the art. However, in 2018, uh, the Army Vice Chief, uh, India's Army Vice Chief, had told a parliamentary committee that three quarters of the Indian Army's equipment was obsolete, one quarter was current, and less than 10% was state of the art. Now, this was an issue that should have caused serious concern and rung alarm bells, but I'm not quite sure that it did. Uh, in India, when we speak of defense modernization, there are two options. Either we make the weapons and systems at home, or we import them. <laughs> Currently, we don't make very, very much at home. So the other option is to import. Um, we have an outlay of about 70 billion US dollars in, in our defense budget. That's the last budget. And this is the third largest defense budget in the world. Unfortunately, a huge proportion of this budget goes into the coffers of countries like Russia, USA, France, Israel, South, <coughs> South Korea, and so on. Why is that? because India ranks amongst the world's top three importer of arms. China, on the other hand, is amongst the world's largest arms exporters and manufacturer, of course, and it supplies weapons to all our neighbors, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. Pakistan gets all its weaponry from China, and that's a reliable source. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to address three issues. Firstly, in spite of being the world's second largest importer of arms, why is our force modernization lagging behind? Secondly, what are the reasons we are unable to make our own weapons and systems? And lastly, what can we do about it? I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to sound a little pessimistic, but I feel that unless we face reality, we can't fix our problems. Fortunately, my fellow panelists will hopefully bring you some more cheerful news. Let's start with the procurement process. Our procedures are so slow and convoluted that it can take anything from 5 to 25 years for a project to materialize. We have many examples of such delays. The advanced jet trainer, which the Air Force was badly in need of, uh, they lost a lot of young pilots under training, it took 25 years to materialize. The multi-role combat aircraft, which is the Rafale now, 16 years. Guns for the Indian artillery took have taken more than three decades. The Navy has been looking for minesweepers for more than 15 years. So you can go on like this. Uh, so it's obvious that if the equipment comes 10 to 15 years after the service uh, asks for it, obviously that's no kind of modernization. So why is this so? Let's look a little deeper. The main reason to my mind is the indifference and lack of involvement of our political leadership in national security issues. But that's a topic by itself and perhaps somebody else can address it. But an important contributory fact has been the unique nature of our higher defense management system in which the armed forces were designated as attached officers and put outside the Ministry of Defense. Other than operational matters, all decisions relating to financial, personnel, infrastructure, and indeed acquisition issues were in the hands of a 100% civilian bureaucracy. Although they're all competent professionals in their own field, and we have a distinguished civil servant with us on this panel. Um, generally, there's a lack of 
or there's inadequate background and knowledge of military systems and military technologies, as well as the demands or the urgency of the operational combat environment. And secondly, in the absence of any accountability for delays, it is not surprising that the Ministry of Defense has often taken decades for the acquisition of vital hardware, which was required yesterday by the schools. However, the good news here is that certain crucial reforms have been instituted earlier this year. The Ministry of Defense has undergone a lot of change in its structure, and one hopes that this change will tell in the <clears throat> acquisition and modernization process. Coming to our uh, indigenous capacity, there is great irony in our inability to modernize the armed forces via this route because India has one of the largest military industrial complexes in the world. It comprises of the huge Defense Research and Development Organization or the DRDO with a pool of talented scientists and a network of 50 laboratories. This is backed by the production facilities of nine defense public sector undertakings and 41 ordnance factories which make ammunition and other equipment of, of need for the armed forces. Uh, this complex has over the years turned out hundreds of fighters, aero engines, tanks, radars, missiles and so on. These are all claimed as indigenous but regrettably many of them are either assembled from kits or produced under license in India on payment of royalty. So they are not really indigenous. There are four major institutional stakeholders whose acts of omission and commission have contributed to India's dismal performance in the field of defense uh, production. Firstly, at the political level, there has so far been little or no appreciation of the need for self-sufficiency in military hardware. While many other sectors like electricity, space, and so on have been guided by long-term plans and targets, <clears throat> there has never been a national vision for attaining self-reliance in defense production. Secondly, I've already mentioned the role of the MOD bureaucracy in the acquisition process. It is the same bureaucracy which wields power and takes executive and financial decisions in the arena of defense production. And we'll hear more about it uh, later, I'm sure. Thirdly, the DRDO for want of adequate interaction with the armed forces and lack of supervision by the Ministry of Defense has failed to deliver. DRDO scientists have focused on technology demonstration and many other self-assigned goals, while the military has waited, waited in vain for <clears throat> actual products that would help modernization and bolster its combat capabilities. And there are many examples. We don't have a serviceable rifle of Indian origin, rifle, pistol, machine gun, bulletproof jackets, a weight component from China. Uh, an intent has gone, in, gone out for winter clothing for our troops in Ladakh right now to the U.S. So these are the lacunae. The Finally, the armed forces must take their share of the blame for not showing adequate interest and involvement in the development of indigenous design and production capabilities. They are often blamed by the scientists for changing their specification now and then and showing a bias towards import as against indigenous uh, product. To sum up, successive governments have shown inadequate appreciation of the fact that import dependency in arms represents a heavy cost as far as, as far as national security is concerned. Reliance on external sources not only erodes our strategic economy, as the chairman pointed out, but also sends a message of encouragement to our adversaries who have not hesitated to employ militancy, cross-border terrorism, terrorism, and even territorial aggression with impunity. And if we ask how do they come to know of our state, let's face the fact that whatever I've said so far, is available in the public domain. The Comptroller and Auditor General renders a report to Parliament. It is also released to the press. The Parliamentary Committee on Defence also tables a report in Parliament, which is available on the internet. So none of this is hidden from our uh, adversaries, and they take great encouragement for, from our reliance on import. Bringing sharp focus to the defence industrial complex will not only help our armed forces modernise and become self-sufficient, it will also provide a huge boost to the economy through growth of ancillary industries, skilling of youth, and massive generation of employment. And in this context, the Prime Minister's Atam Nirbhartha campaign is very timely and relevant for the defense sector. But let's remember that as, as in all other programs, the success of Atam Nirbhartha will depend entirely on the vision, strategy, and implementation and monitoring plan. Let me conclude by pointing out 
by by placing before you six uh, six points uh, which can formulate a, which can form a strategy for the future we need to make a clean break from the past and create an action plan for rejuvenation and accelerated growth of our defense industrial base uh, and this should span not five year span of elections but 50 year plan i recommend the strategy to cover six measures one creation of a ministry of defense technology and production to be headed by a minister with a professional rather than a political background and whose attention is not taken up by electioneering but by the topic of his portfolio secondly the launching of an r&d mission for realization of capabilities many key areas such as propulsion systems sensors weapons robotics artificial intelligence cyber and so on thirdly creating a genuine synergy between the public and private sectors by investing the private sector as a full partner in r&d as well as in production fourth reorganization and restructuring of the drdo to enable user participation in decision making fifth mandating the involvement of armed forces starting from the concept design stage in terms of personnel funding and so on and lastly specifying time frames for attainment of capability development after which the project should be foreclosed by drdo and external help sought thank you ladies and gentlemen i have finished and i'll wait for discussion and questions uh, uh, later on thank you thank you sir for your exceedingly comprehensive and very all encompassing uh, uh, presentation i would like at this point to uh, invite our second speaker air marshal philip rajkumar who was commissioned into the indian air force in 1962 is a fighter pilot with numerous frontline squadron experiences and tenures he had 22 operational missions in the 1965 indo pak war and earned a a mention in dispatches there in 1971 he was selected to do experimental test flight pilot training in france thereafter he has dedicated 20 years in this specialized field of flight testing his operational assignments are numerous in the front line squadrons in punjab jaguars in the central sector uh, in the country he was specially selected by dr abdul kalam for the aeronautical development agency targeted for the planning and execution of testing of the challenging light combat aircraft tejas the recent introduction of tejas into the indian air force is undoubtedly linked to his untiring efforts on this aircraft a graduate of defense services staff college royal college of defense studies an msc from chennai university He is the recipient of the Param Vishesh Seva Medal, Ati Vishesh Seva Medal, and uh, Vayu Sena Medal. He is the president of the Aeronautical Society, and then subsequently was elected an honorary fellow. Now uh, there is nothing like statistics to speak for a man's life, and I'd like to say that he has flown five thousand two hundred air hours. on 55 different types of aircraft sir may i request you to speak on indigenization a success story with a brief overview of the defense public sector undertaking thank you thank you general langa morning ladies and gentlemen i will restrict my talk to indigenization success stories as far as projection of air power is concerned air power is the projection of national power using the air medium and i'll start with the biggest success story of all which is india's strategic deterrent india's strategic deterrent based on the land based agni missile and the submarine launched ballistic missiles with our nuclear submarines is entirely home grown so i think having a strategic deterrent entirely indigenous through indigenous efforts is a very big success story which not many people take note of and this has been due to the efforts of the drdo baba atomic research center and defense psus the second biggest success story is 
about our missile program. The Agni missiles and the Akash air defense missile, the Astra beyond visual range missile, and recently the firing of the anti-radiation missiles and the BrahMos missile from an aircraft are all success stories which bear notice, which people should take notice of. Now, the as far as the missile program is concerned, the Astra BVR missile, as uh, Mr. Prasad pointed out earlier, that it takes 20 years to reach fruition. I had chaired the initial meeting of the Astra BVR missile way back in uh, the year 2000, and it is just about entering service. This is a very big step forward. For the very first time, India is going to have its own indigenous air-to-air -air missile. It has been successfully test-fired from the Sukhoi-30 and is going to be adapted to even the Rafale in times to come. Then we move on to aircraft per se. Of course, I was involved in the Tejas program for a long time. So the Tejas itself is a very big success story because we started off by saying that we will acquire competence in four defense technologies, critical technologies. One is the fly-by-wire flying control system. Second is a mission computer-based cockpit displays. Third is the use of composite materials in the airframe. And fourth was the use of computer-based health monitoring systems of the aircraft. As far as the fly-by-wire system is concerned, initially we took help from the Americans, Lockheed Martin in particular, but now we have complete indigenous capability to design the control law, make the hardware, develop the software, and we have also successfully indigenized the hardware element of the electro-hydraulic actuators with the help of Godridge Industries, we've been able to indigenize the actuators, which is again a very big success story. <coughs> Excuse me. As for composite structures, we imported the composite material initially. They are called pre pregs They will come in little strips which are laid, laid one on top of the other. And we set up a pilot plant in Bangalore to manufacture this composite pre-pregs, and we transferred the technology to a private sector company. But unfortunately, because the order quantity was so low, the private sector factory said, sorry, we cannot take, make the necessary investments for such a small order. Now, this is a problem which we are going to face with when we try to indigenize, and I'll come back to it later. The other Important thing is the mission computer based uh, cockpit displays. The mission computer is entirely indigenous. The software is indigenous. It will be interesting for you to know that the Tejas has 2.5 million lines of code sitting in it, all developed indigenously, verified indigenously, and tested indigenously. The next su big success story is in the rotary wing area. We have the 300th ALH advanced light helicopter has been delivered to the services. And we started off with the ALH prototype flying in 1992. And 28 years later, it is the fourth version, the Mark IV, which is being delivered to the services. We've also successfully developed the light combat helicopter and the light utility helicopter, both of which are about to be certified and orders are awaited from the services. The projects in the pipeline are the advanced medium combat aircraft, the LCA Mark II, and of course, the Navy's twin-engine deck-based fighter. Incidentally, it's worth mentioning here that the naval version of the LCA Mark I has successfully landed on the carrier INS Vikramaditya in January this year. It is another big success story. The DPSUs involved in aeronautics chiefly are Hindustan Aeronautics, Bharat Electronics, and Bharat Dynamics. Bharat Dynamics in Hyderabad has been hugely successful 
in developing the hardware for India's missile program. HAL, of course, is a behemoth without which we cannot survive. Neither the Indian Air Force, the Naval Aviation, I mean, the Aviation Wing of the Naval Indian Navy can survive for a single day without the involvement of Hindustan Aeronautics. And Hindustan Aeronautics cannot survive without orders from the services. So it is a symbiotic relationship which needs to be developed and fostered. As far as the private sector is concerned, the same problem of small quantities, the domestic market by itself cannot sustain the private sector. The private sector has to develop globally competitive products, both in technology and cost, and they should be able to export it. Now, defense exports is an area which we have not even touched seriously. And the defense export market is highly developed in the Western world. And China has got into this game. And they are exporting to all the smaller countries. And unless we make a foray into the international arms bazaar, we will not be able to sustain a vibrant private sector. It is OK for the defense PSUs because they are being sustained by the government. But if you want the private sector to contribute, they have to export and they need government support to do that, especially in terms of advertising and publicizing the products. I'll give you an example of what happened in the Bahrain Air Show in January 9, 2016. The Tejas went there for its first international debut. And the Ministry of, of External Affairs, um, the Minister Sushma Swaraj was there. But there was no preceding publicity campaign and very little interest was evoked in the general public by the presence of the Tejas. So if you're going to go to international displays and so on, it must be preceded by a public relations offensive about which we know very little and it is time we got into this game. Otherwise, we cannot develop a vibrant private sector making defense products. General Admiral Prakash mentioned this, that I think the biggest drawback that we have is that there is no national vision. We don't have a strategic vision as far as the country is concerned. Where does India want to be in 25 years? Where does India want to be in 50 years? Where does India want to be in 100 years? Now, China has done exactly this. When Deng Xiaoping took over China in the 19, after Chairman Mao in the late 70s, he enunciated the four modernization programs. And they also said that at the 100th anniversary of the Communist Revolution, that is in 2049, we will be the number one country in the world. And they are moving towards that in a very, very determined way. And we can see that. But unfortunately, in the Indian government, successive governments at the center have failed to enunciate a national vision, a national strategic vision of which defense modernization and defense indigenization is a very, very important part. So I would say that it is not all gloom as far as the indigenization efforts in the aviation sector are concerned. Many good things have happened. Many more things are in the pipeline. But if you want the private sector to play a leading role, they must be allowed to export for which they need government support. I have finished. And uh, I will await questions from the audience later. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for uh, giving a very interesting expose based on your personal experience, uh, which in any case is irreplaceable. Um, I would now like to take the opportunity to <coughs> invite Shri Sanjay Prasad, IAS, who presently is a state election commissioner since September 2019 when he retired from the IAS uh, service. He is of the Gujarat Kada and he has, in his initial years, done extensive service in Gujarat as a collector and district magistrate in Gandhinagar, Dangs, Jamnagar, and thereafter he had appointments in ministries 
and in districts in the fields of labor, relief, education, social justice, agriculture, among others. He thereafter had a very fine tenure in the Ministry of Defense at Delhi between 2002 and 2007, where he was a director at that stage, linked to all three services in the domains of training, air acquisition, Navy, training of establishments of the Army, military schools, NCC, Sainik schools, adventure and sports. He thereafter had a very privileged exposure in the Indian Embassy in Moscow as a counselor uh, from 2007 to 2011, where he dealt with intergovernmental projects related to defense and security. He will speak to us, ladies and gentlemen, on the aspects of indigenous design and production of advanced technology weapon systems. And he'll also cover aspects of policy. Shri Sanjay Prasad, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a privilege to be here on discussing this very important topic and also with such a distinguished panel. I would like to first uh, state that uh, defense production and indigenization of the pr production of weapon systems and their design is not only desirable, but it is very, very essential. And you have to only look into Indian history to realize its importance. I was a student of history. And I was always intrigued when I read about the old battles that in the morning we were always winning. And then in the afternoon, suddenly we start losing. If you see the history of most battles, that was what was pointed out. And then I went deep into it. The reason is that our metallurgy was poor. So our swords were very heavy yeah, because to have the cutting part, you had the weight to had to be added to the sword. And as a result, the soldiers by the afternoon, they would get tired and then it would not be possible to sustain the fight. And also the number of people who could be deployed, they were limited to those who were very physically fit. So that restricted the size of the actually teeth to tail ratio, the people who could actually fight. While our adversaries who mostly came from the West, they had very good swords, Damascus swords, which were very light. And so they could fight with those swords and not get tired even in the afternoon. And at the same time, even those who were not in the front line, like camp retainers, etc., they could be armed with the swords and they would also be used for guarding the flanks and safeguarding the core areas. So they, that was an advantage. Secondly, we never had good breeding of horses in India. So all our horses were important. The good horses which were used for fighting they came from the West and our invaders also came from the West and they could easily block the in route of the horses and the supply of horses at critical times and our forces were left in a very difficult position while the invaders had plentiful supply of good horses. So they could change the horses after every two, three hours while our people were staying on the same horse throughout the fight. The example of Chetak is very important. So besides the human, the horses also were getting tired by the afternoon. So our failure in the armed production of weapons, breeding of horses, etc., that was one of the major reasons why we kept losing battles and we were insubordinated for thousands of years. So this is something which has not been highlighted. But if you see Indian history, the reason we were insubordinated was because we lacked an indigenous defense production and breeding of horses, which was the cavalry, the tanks, and armored personal carriers of today. So th this is a very, very critical topic. And till our metallurgy was good in the ancient periods, we were not invaded so often. And our armies would stand up to the other armies. And we, our empires were extended into the Middle East up to Afghanistan also during the ancient period. So you see, indigenous production of weapons is something absolutely critical to our strategic autonomy, which has already been pointed out and we cannot do without it. And looking back into Indian history itself, you will see that. However, and also 
there is a big debate always going on that if you increase defense allocation then it will cut into development expenditure etc but if we have the indigenous production of weapon indigenous design of weapons then this whole debate gets nullified because the production of weapons the design that will create multiplier effects within the economy as has been pointed out this lca for example our missile programs they are mostly indigenous based if you look at our latest ship building programs the frigates say project 28 all the 90% plus of the very advanced technology ships are indigenous in content so you see by having this kind of defense production indigenously you are promoting large scale industrialization downstream which will have impact on employment on income generation etc so that defense outlay will add to the national outlay not to the national economy and employment creation which atmanirbharta which sir had talked about now i would like to say that i am not totally pessimistic about this because we have large number of success stories if you see in the air sphere the lca has been totally designed here with very advanced technology composites advanced avionics etc large number of missile systems as has been pointed out they have been used in india and with very huge indigenous content and with the support of large number of small and medium industries then our advanced light helicopter light observation helicopter light combat helicopter all these are success stories and in artillery if you see artillery acquisition was a real minefield as <laughs> has pointed out a large number of cases the things had come to an advanced stage and then they had to be cancelled repeatedly but now if you see the with the cooperation of the private sector large number of artillery systems are being developed and introduced which are indigenous in content and the biggest success story i would like to say which uh, has not been sort of written about much is that in the naval ship building our naval ships the destroyers frigates corvettes they are among the most heavily armed and most uh, sensitive in terms of their sensors capability integration of sensors and weapon systems and uh, they are among the best designed ships in their category in the entire world and the reason for this as sir was saying that we should integrate production and design and long term planning has to be there which was pointed out is because we have a naval design bureau within the naval headquarters that is doing the design of the ships integrating various weapon systems for example the ships may be having the guns italian automalera guns anti submarine rockets may be russian in origin the anti aircraft missiles may be israeli all those may be integrated with radars which may be from a different country so all this integration and finally the war management system within the ship integrating the avionics weapon systems and all the <coughs> sensors sonars are developed indigenously by drdo so you see an indian ship is having weapon systems and sensors from large number of sources but all have been integrated together by the naval design bureau so we have a very successful system here a very successful model within the country where uh, within the headquarters of the navy the systems are designed developed integrated and then constant interaction with the shipyards how to get it into production all these things are carried out so i suggest that to have the same kind of thing with the other services also because that will develop an institutional memory certain philosophy for concept of development and deployment of these weapon systems then also integration of the weapon systems into the platforms just now our approach is very platform centric we want one kind of tank one kind of aircraft one kind of ship but the weapon systems integration now that we are doing it with the astra missile for example and the anti radiation missile and other missiles brahmos missile for example is integrated from sub surface ship land air all the kinds of things are now being integrated together so this kind of integration of the weapon systems with different platforms that is something which we have started which should go on in a big way and i think that i am very optimistic that we will go into it and develop the indigenous weapon systems 
indigenously. And other thing is that with indigenous weapon systems, you can have quantity, you can produce in large numbers to equip the forces substantially rather than importing it in limited numbers. During the Second World War, Germany had the best tanks. The American Sherman tanks and the Russian T-34 were qualitatively inferior to the tanks. However, quantity is a quality in itself. So if the large number of deployment is there, there is saturation at the battlefield level and it's difficult to counteract the numbers. So I think that uh, indigenous production of weapon systems is very important and we are having success stories within the country which we should build on and develop our uh, capabilities based on this. And uh, the government has taken a large number of steps in the defense procurement policy also. A number of steps have been taken to encourage the indigenous production of weapons make in India. And at the same time, the, recently the government has announced the no import list for large number of weapon systems. Now that will lead to the production of these weapon systems in India and long term planning for production of weapon systems in India. I think that it's not only desirable, but it's absolutely imperative that we go in for indigenization and production of weapon systems within the country. And our history itself is showing that lack of attention to producing weapons, good quality weapons, that has been one of the main reasons why we had the history that we have had. But I think we are doing well. And if we build on the success stories, take those models as case studies, we can do well. And I entirely agree with the views expressed earlier by Admiral Prakash and sir that we have to integrate our decision making process also better. Here also the government has taken steps. The chief of defense staff is there and more active involvement of the armed forces and decision making is there now. So I think that a lot of tweaking is there. When we are designing a weapon system, it takes a long time. But if everyone is working in silos, we need the time when we realize that something has to be improved or some modifications made, it's too late. So all that work already gone and gets wasted. So Sorry I think better I had a question. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Very, very, that's very uh, uh, different point of view and in a very, very focused point of view. If I was to um, briefly summate what the eminent speakers have put across today and what you ladies and gentlemen need to definitely deliberate on, there is so much uh, experience and there is so much emotion and there is so much knowledge that these three panelists have put across to you. Uh, it covers a huge spectrum, which uh, will do well for all of you to deliberate on. But uh, the Admiral has left us with a very fine model of his six points, which definitely needs serious deliberation and implementation for the long term, uh, shall I say, strategy of, of uh, self-reliance. It's a very fine model. Uh, Air Marshal, sir, has given very impressive successive, uh, successes in missiles and aircrafts. He's simultaneously highlighted the problems of private sector, whereby uh, small quantities do not dedicate a market to them and do not make an economic model for them. And these are real-time problems of, of, of the private sector. Uh, Sri Sanjay Saad has um, deliberated on history, talked about the positive aspects of an excellent guns, ships, and uh, missile and aircraft programs, and has talked about integration of production and design, which has already happened in the Indian Navy, and talked about propagation of a successful model to other uh, areas of defense production and, and reliance. Uh, thank you all, gentlemen, for very, very uh, perceptive and revealing views. In conclusion, I would only like to say, and again, very few issues. For self-reliance in defense, critically more than in other sectors, there has to be a happy marriage between the requirements of capability development, finance, and knowledge. And this has to be a long-term convergence.
it cannot be a short term convergence. That is how it moves in the real world. Policy changes are excellent. They are required. They drive a whole chain of, of reactions after them. But policy changes without changes in architecture, structures, and functional ethos are of little relevance. That is my personal experience. As a user, for 40 years with imported equipment, which I had, I had mostly imported tanks. This best arrangements of import leave huge gaps in intellectual property, follow-on service repair, ammunition, and the inability to domesticate critical aspects of those equipment. We have to master in the Indian context the ability to locate talent, isolate talent, and put it in the correct place. And in, in conclusion, I would like to say a backwardness, and I'm using a crude word, but backwardness of nations has proved to be an advantage. Because when you choose to pick up what modernized nations have done, you don't struggle through their mistakes. You take only their best models and replicate them. That advantage we have in India, but that advantage can only manifest if you have the will and focus to execute. Ladies and gentlemen, we have concluded what we had to put across to you on this highly uh, focused and very, very difficult national issue which we deal with. I would leave the floor open now for questions at an appropriate time. Thank you all panelists. It's been a pleasure being here.